<laughs> but the, uh, there is a little bit of extra content on the end of this lecture uh, with the strip of sleep batting. I think it's extremely important for us to understand that. But So we'll get through it. Um, chest tubes um, is a big deal in this, in this uh, unit uh, with the treatment of hemothorax and pneumothorax. Remember, if you start seeing these abbreviations, that's what that is. Pneumothorax, pneumothorax. Uh, and often a patient will have a, what they call a pneumothorax. It's just a combination of both. It often happens together. But just keep that in mind. The patient will often have a pneumothorax that you see bloody drainage and don't let it confuse you because they often have both of them together. Okay. So, anyhow. So, the treatment of a, of a pneumothorax, pneumothorax is a thoracostomy tube. Well, that's the fancy word for a chest tube. Um, so, the chest tube is put in during a cerebral procedure. Usually, it's put in at the bedside um, or the OR. Um, so, if, it's, if, the chest, if the injury has happened within the hospital, they've been on the vent, and the vent has given them attention to the thorax, then they'll do it at the bedside. But if the patient had a chest surgery or something like that, they'll come back from the operating room. Okay. So, but just be able to uh, manage the chest tube. It's your biggest responsibility. But the chest tube is this tube right here, and that tube is placed into the pleural space. And remember, the pleural space is where the fluid or the air is. So the purpose of the chest tube is to evacuate any fluid or air from the pleural space to decompress the lung, because the lung was coming. Compressed by the air of the fluid, so it decompresses it and lets the lung expand. Okay. <clears throat> the chest tube, which is the actual tube that is inserted inside of the body, is connected to a drainage tube and a drainage collection of the body. It's a drainage system. So a lot of people will call the things on the floor the chest tube. Well, that's really not the chest tube, that's the drainage collection of the body. The chest tube is what's in the chest. When you see Chest tubes, sometimes they're in different positions. Sometimes you will see them actually anteriorly, you know, on the front of the body. and But usually we'll, you will see them laterally. Um, but realize that a chest tube will be placed higher on the chest and more anteriorly if it's air, right? That makes more sense because air goes up. Um, and if it's a hemothorax, more fluid that's in there, um, it will be placed lower and more laterally. Okay. Sometimes you can see chest tubes put in posterior to tube. This is the type of chest tube that you will see probably most commonly in the hospital. So, um, this is the collection device, right? So, um, the, the brand is Atrium, and probably every hospital in the city uses this brand. So, if, you, if you've been in clinical or if you've been working in the hospital for a while, you've probably seen one of these. And maybe you didn't know what it was before, you were afraid to touch it. Um, so, the, um, the a chest tube collection system has three chambers. We look at this and you say, well, that looks like five to me, right? Well, this chamber here is all one, right? This is one chamber, and that's the other chamber. So the first chamber here, chamber A, is the suction control chamber. That's where the suction is connected to. So this little piece right here, um, actually one of those pieces would stand up and attach to suction. So the suction is, is connected to this first chamber. In that chamber, you put water. Sterile water is put in. Usually, we do have dry suction, but for our purposes, we'll talk about the water. And then you have a water seal chamber. So that's all of this, it's B and C. So this is, there's also water put into here. Um, and this, the C uh, section right here is the, is the air leak detection part of the water seal chamber. So if the patient has an air leak, and we'll talk more about that later, you can detect it and the severity of it here in this C section. The collection, where the actual fluid goes, is in this uh, D side. So it would begin over here. So this piece right here would connect to the actual chest tube, and it would drain into this. And, and so it would start to fill from zero and work its way up. And as this one gets full, what happens? It spills over and starts to fill this one. It fills up, it spills over, and starts to fill that one. And the reason for this, why, you think, well, why don't we just have a big, giant collection thing? Well, it's easier to measure, number one. And also, the drainage can change in color and consistency and things like that. So you can assess changes. So this very frequently, you'll see your patient, maybe all three are nearly full. You see that this one was red, this one was serosanguinous, and this one was red. So you can see that the bleeding can stop. Right? 
if we're all mixed together, it would just look all the same. So it's better for assessment and measuring. Alright? Like I said, sometimes the chest tubes are emergent, or emergent is put in at the bedside of the ICU, patients on the vent, whatever, something happens. Um, and this patient becomes acutely dyspneic, dyspneic, you assess, no lung sounds, call the doctor, set up for a chest tube, and we'll put it in. This happens in about 30 minutes, right? So you, we have a lot of responsibilities that go along with this. So this is an invasive procedure, so an informed consent should be obtained if possible. When you are in the situation and um, the physician or whoever is putting this chest tube in, chest tube in says, give me the supplies, what do you have to know what to do? All right, so the biggest thing that you need to have is a, is a thoracostomy tray or a, um, a chest tube tray. It's the same thing. Chest two, they do it in the patient's room, not close to the surgeon's room. At the bedside. When you say at the bedside, what does that mean? In the patient's room, right? So, um, chest two, thoracostomy two, um, tray, and if that is not available, what should you order? Any surgical beds in there? A combo tray. That's right. A combo tray pretty much has everything. It's a big thing with a whole bunch of different tools in it. But the physician is going, going to want a chest tube tray if they have it. And this comes up from Central Supply. It's got all the sterile supplies on it that they need to insert into this tube. The general supplies for insertion of anything into the body, right? Lidocaine, sterile gloves, gauze, all of that, those things. Make sure that you get the chest tube and you get the chest tube drainage system. The chest, the chest tube is also sutured in, so you would need to suture. If the patient is fairly stable, um, they, can be sit, they can sit up, which is probably the best position for the chest tube in, um, but also the patient, the patient can be sidelined, but it's your responsibility to position the patient, stay with the patient, make sure they're quite stable. You get, like I said, you get the supplies, you keep an eye on the patient, uh, you uh, make sure the serial technique is not breached, and also you're responsible for connecting the chest tube to the device after it's put in. So when, when they put the tube in, they will have hemostats connected to it. You know what hemostats are? Just clamps. So clamps on it as it goes in, um, because we don't want to create an open flow between the portal space and the environment or the atmosphere. So as it's put in, it's clamped, but then it's your responsibility to connect it and then unclamp it and let it start to flow. Okay, so you have to be there every time as this is being put in. Mr. Sanderson? Yes, ma'am. Um, just a quick question. First, when you get a chest tube and you have too much fluid in your chest, that would miss it, right? Yeah, the so, or the the right. And they put it in, and then they drain it. I, I watched the YouTube video. And then, how long do they keep that in? It stays in until it stops draining. And the patient's lung has free fluid. It could be in for a week or two. I had the same patient a few weeks in a row with same chest chest tube. Tube. But it'll stay in for a little bit. If, if they just, if they feel like it's not an acute problem and they need to drain something off, they'll do a boracentesis and just pull it off and then go. That's what I saw. Yeah. Boracentesis. Yes, ma'am. This might sound silly, but this is closed. So what do we do when it fills up? Does it go in a red bile hydro bag? We'll talk about it. Yep. We just dispose of it. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the, all that stuff. We got a few more slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when, at, at, before the insertion, you should prepare your drainage system. Um, make sure that the um, the water seal chamber is filled. That the water seal, uh, that the uh, suction chamber is also filled uh, with uh, water. I talked about how you connect the tube the drainage system to the tube after the, after the insertion. And it's also very important that every connection between the tubing should be taped and nicely secured. Because if it's not nicely secured, that's, it could cause what we would say an air leak. And we don't want that to happen. Nine times out of ten, when the tube is first put in, it will be to suction. So you need to connect it to suction initially, um, as to low suction. Uh, but, all, but by putting fluid, into the suction chamber, that regulates the amount of suction that it gets. So 
really, you could you could put the wall section at the top, and the patient still would only get maybe a 20 centimeter, you know, um, but that's really unnecessary. So you just put the wall section at low. You anticipate uh, gentle bubbling in the suction chamber. You put a star here, underline it, okay? You anticipate that there will be bubbling in the suction chamber. Because there's suction attached to this, pulling back, negative pressure, causing bubbles. That's okay. You don't want it to look like a hot tub, but uh, uh, some bubbles is, are expected. They should be there for this suction. Gentle bubbles. Gentle, continuous bubbles. Because this works by both suction and gravity, the device should be, the collection device should be below the level of the chest, right? Um, because because it, it stands kind of like a, a tower and it's very thin, it's not very thick, so it can easily fall over. So there's this little kickstand down here that kind of helps to prevent that, but that really doesn't do a whole lot. Um, so the, I think the best thing to do is to attach it to the bed. So you can, it's got hooks on it, you can hook it onto the side of the bed. Or if you can't do that, if that, that bed rail is in the wrong position, it's not working, you uh, put some silk tape on the floor to hold it up right. Because if it turns over, it's going to make your life not so fun. Um, but if it knocks over, what's the first thing that you should do? Take it out of it. All right? So um, some nurses will tell you if you knock the chest tube over, you have to get a new one. Or if the chest tube is trying to use the device, you have to get a new one. That's not true. You can save it. Okay? So make sure, first, pick it up. And then you want to see if any water has been lost or missed um, or moved around to the wrong areas in the device. So make sure that you've got enough water in the suction chamber. Make sure that you've got enough water in the water seal. Because it has those three chambers in the drainage chamber, it, it, it can all spill over like it should be, and all three of those will be even more than you can't measure anything, right? Well, you can backfill it. You can get it back to the right side of this. If all of that is not possible, if you can't make it work properly again, properly again then you replace the drainage device. Okay. We talked about air leaks briefly, um, but the, an air leak is means that there is air entering the, the drainage system from somewhere uh, that is unexpected. So uh, you should not have an air leak. That's what's most important. Understand. So, the water seal chamber is the, the chamber that should that would detect an air leak. So, if there is an air leak, uh, the first thing that you want to do is make sure that all your connections are tight, the air is not being sucked in from the atmosphere, uh, and then check your patient. Um, realize that in the water seal chamber, it's okay to see bubbles every now and then. And the detection would be bubbles in the water seal chamber that would detect an air leak. Bubbles in water seal. But you expect every once in a while to see a few bubbles. That's okay, and that's probably and it would be expected, especially if it's an initial insert on a hemothorax, because you want the air to be pulled out, right? So bubbles here and there are okay. Occasional bubbles in the water seal chamber are okay. I said that about five times. Um, but if you have continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber, what's going on? Air, air leak, right? The water seal chamber, I think it confuses people, but just think about the words. Seal. It creates a seal between the patient's total face and between the environment. So if, um, think about, if anybody here knows anything about plumbing, but if you don't, look under your cabinet, which I'm sure you have, and there's the trap. The little hook thing that goes down, that's a water seal. Okay? It's a water seal that keeps the sewage separate from the atmosphere in your house. That's the plumbing seal. It also catches necklaces. <laughs> um, but the purpose of it is a water seal. So when you drain down the sink, water stays in there. And that keeps it's a water seal between the sewer and between your house. Right? So that's that's what the water seal and the chest tube does. It keeps the atmosphere and your patient separate. Hopefully that makes a lot of work. So in the A, in the suction control chamber, you right. should anticipate continuous bubbling. Because suction is attached to it, yep. Okay, and B, in the water seal chamber, occasional bubbles are okay, not but not continuous. Perfect. That means there's an air leak. I understand? Good. Okay. What did you say you assess first? What? Make sure the first thing is to assess 
the integrity of the tube. Make sure that because we talked about how we think of the chest tube, the drainage device, um, that's probably the most common place to be poured in air. Uh, so we can resecure that, wrap some silk tape around it, uh, because you certainly don't want it to become disconnected with it, because then you're taking spoil space, so that the environment can be absolutely on that. What should, uh, I mean, if that happens, and I mean, is there any kind of other, what, what should we do other than just, just reconnect it? Yeah. Yeah. And assess your patient to make sure that I'm going to just really compromise. Because the, the, in theory, the patient could suck air into that because the negative pressure in the chest can pull air from the but by reconnecting it, it should be able to pull it back down. But a session patient can force and make sure they don't risk the complications. Okay. Sometimes patients just have an air leak and they've had the air leak for three days. This is nothing to be excited about. Somebody knows about this. Uh, in report, they're going to say, you know, when the patient has an air leak in the chest tube. And you're going to say, okay, so when you go in to assess the water seal, you don't get excited about the bubbles in the water seal. So if it's ongoing and somebody knows about the patient's okay, we're just watching it. But if it's new, airway, not good. Okay. So in that case, they would have checked off the next and take everything out. They probably did a chest x ray and looked at the patient, redressed it, resecured it, everything. So there's just an airway from somewhere. Um, in, in the water seal chamber, also remember that. If you see the fluid in there moving, that is actually what we expect. It's called tidally. So if the respiration could cause a change in pressure, that water still is going to move a little bit. Right? You see it tidally, rising and falling. That is not an air leak. An air leak is what? Continuous by the way, the water still. Okay? Yes. So if, you had, if the patient had an air leak, what if I will assess the, resp uh, the patient's respiratory status? What we expect if they cause the problem? <clears throat> Hopefully the patient's okay. What if it's not right? okay? What if they're not? Then you would follow what you need to do. You would reconnect, you would assess, you would give oxygen if necessary, and you would call the physician. Uh, she wants to know what are findings to expect. Oh, yeah, the, findings. <laughs> the findings of the pneumothorax. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Decreased breath sounds, so kidnea, dyspnea, tachycardia, chest pain. Right? Because it, because if they're if it becomes disconnected and the lung becomes compressed, what's happening? So yeah, the lung collapses. Just to say, how does that amazing the air? It doesn't. Well, that's a good question actually. Let's go back to it. It doesn't necessarily measure the air, but so so you know this 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 side goes to the patient, right? This side goes to suction, water seal right here, all right? So if there is an air leak, if there's air being pulled from this side where it shouldn't be, um, you would have continuous bubbling down here. This is the, water, the air leak detection area. Okay, so if there would be air coming in here. So this is called, you can't really see it, but this is the, uh, the air leak monitor area because this right here, is, it says one, two, three, four, five. If it's a minor air leak, you're just going to see bubbles barely coming around, just hitting them. If it's a more severe, it'll, it'll come out and be hitting the two and the three. More bubbles coming out further. That's a worse air leak. A really bad air leak, there's just bubbles all in. Okay. So that's how you would, I think, maybe that answers your question, how you measure the air. You don't measure the air necessarily, but you can measure the severity of the air leak by how far in here the, air, the bubbles travel over. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The chest tube should have a dressing on it. The patient with the chest tube should receive at least two four-hour assessments. Um, the dressing should be uh, nice, secure, but it should not be occlusive. If it's occlusive, that could cause a tension pneumothorax because if there's any air in there, we want it to escape if it needs to. We simply want it to be covered and not so secure. So just remember that when you have that, that um, dressing, that you should have three sides take and one side should remain in. Right? Often what nurses will do is they think that's supposed to be real tight and secure and they'll get gauze and they'll put tons of silk tape over it and make it real secure and think they're doing a really good job. Um, but really you should leave one side untaped. Usually leave the bottom untaped because that's the part where the tube comes out. So just leave that bottom untaped, the sides and top.
one side, now we'll take this. Um, often, um, what you'll see is a chest tube with the drainage tubing just looping down on the ground and coming back up. Well, that's called a dependent loop, right? Because what it is trapped in there and it can inhibit the flow. So what it, the best thing to do, it's hard to, to visualize, but you know how you have a water hose and you wrap it up, you know? Kind of wrap it up in a circle and just lay that in your head. And therefore, it can easily go from the side and drain right down into the chest. Tube. That's really how we over the tube too. It's hard to do that too, but you shouldn't have a dependent loop in the over the tube. There's no trap to that. So make sure that it's draining nicely and there aren't any kinks, because if there's kinks, what could happen? Attention in the thorax, right? I have a question. I was reading in the book. I got confused. Okay, it says, okay, whenever you want the system to be a closed sealed system, um, it says it's vital to prevent air from entering the pleural space, and you pretty much make an open immunothorax, right? Is that, is that, did I read that right? It's Technically, open, that's what you're making with the... Technically, because you're allowing it to escape. But it's not, but the air is not entering the pleural space, it's only exiting. Okay, and then that's yeah, and we then don't want the to enter. tension in one that's with the gauze and the... That's if, stuff. that's if you have um, air leaking into the pleural space, but it can't escape. So we could cause that with potentially that's why with, you don't with this want tight, to tight dressing okay. and a kink tube or something like that. Okay, I was you confused, because one says to sense? close it all the way, and the other one says don't close it all the way. The system, so like, the system is a closed system. But still, it's able to, air is able to escape. That's the whole purpose of the fluid. And the air leak tells us that there's an opening somewhere, but it's not the closest one. Um, two things that we should never do to a chest tube, usually. Um, two, one thing that we never do is to strip or milk the chest tube. What the, you, you may not know what that means, but just imagine if you were to milk a cow and how you would squeeze and pulling down and stripping things. Because sometimes you have uh, clotted blood that gets stuck in there and you get sticky stuff and this isn't draining good, you know, and, and you will be tempted to strip it. Because sometimes you do strip it, like a JP drain. You, you strip a JP drain and set it on the drain. Um, but we, we can do that. But you don't strip a chest tube because what you do by stripping, you create negative pressure. And the, the tube that is inside of the patient, the end of the tube in the patient, will, can suck against the lung and cause trauma. You don't strip the chest or milk it, same thing. What you should do if you have something stuck in there is you just gently massage it and squish it around, hoping you can get it flowing out. If not, we can, we can irrigate it, um, but we would, we would ask the patient to do that. So, Shelly, you're going to see much more things. <laughs> Imagine the day that you see maggots coming out of your cup. I know, you're going to see it all. All of it. Why don't you go work somewhere? What's your thing? You're right, you're right. 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 You're to see if the patient does okay, because if you clamp it, essentially it's not there. So if you clamp it, you know, that's an assessment for um, if the patient can tolerate without the chest tube. But um, that's something that we never do. The only time that we would ever do this is when we change the collection device. So if we're connecting a new tube to the chest tube, we will have to clamp it and then connect it and then immediately unclamp it. Because we don't want it to be an open uh, space between the, the the atmosphere and the, and the pearl <laughs> space. Or the physician might order to clamp the chest tube. Clamp the chest tube, monitor the patient closely for 30 minutes. You know, no respiratory compromise, leave it clamped. So that's testing to see if it can be pulled out. So if you don't want to pull it out, oops, they still needed it. You know, <laughs> and then you have to put it back in the base on respiratory distress. So. But never clamp the chest tube unless you're changing the system or if there's an order to do so. Because you could call us what? Attention to the device. Talk about the assessment of the patient every four hours, but I'll, of course that's everything. It says the drainage every four hours as well. If the drainage is greater than 70 milliliters per hour, that tells you that something's going on. It should never be greater than that. So that tells you that maybe there's some new bleeding happening, new drainage, something like that. So that should be reported. 
or if the drainage changes to bloody, cloudy, warm, you know, if it's warm, that means it's going to be actively. Um, so those things should be reported. Change your dressing if it's dirty. Um, if you feel like that something is bleeding under there, you probably have learned this before, but if you feel like a, dress, a patient is bleeding heavily under a dressing, what should you not do? Remove the dressing, right? You should reinforce it with some pressure. So don't go taking the dressing. Oh, this is bloody. I'm changing blood everywhere. Well, I'll leave it all in there, put it in on top of it, and put a lot of pressure on it. That's unlikely to happen, but it could with a chest tube. Right. Already said this. One side should be open, help prevent attention in the brothers. Just because a patient has a chest tube does not mean that they should not ambulate. You still want them to walk. So what do they do? They let them carry it with them. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes the suction, the, the, the chest tube is connected to suction that can create a bit more of a problem with, with mobility. But if the chest tube is not the suction, then they can just carry it around, or you can carry it for a monitor. But chest tubes are portable, keep that in mind. Alright? And don't ever pull out a chest tube. Not fun. Alright? They're nice and secure down with some stitches and stitches, but um, just, it, they can still be ripped out. So, But if you rip one out, there was a lot of tension on this. Mr. Sanser, do they have, like, at the end of the chest tube that's already inside of your body? Does it have a little ball on your end? Does it have a ball, but it's. A, it's 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 um it's narrowed at the end a little bit, and it's all it also has not holes only in the end of it, but also on in the side along the edge. You know what a French drain is? It's kind of like that. Um, and the edge is also not sharp; and just like it's cut off. It's nice and rounded and smooth because it gives us a trauma for that space. And the way they keep it in place is it's sutures. not like a foley with the no no it's sutured in. Sutured. And also, what, what we also do is um, on the tube, on the, on the chest, we can take some silk tape and tape it real nicely down so that if there is any tension, it takes that tape first and not the sutures. The sutures are just removing You never want to yank out a chest tape. Right? And, uh, Angela, did I answer your question that you had? I did it? Okay, ask me. I just asked, what do we, as a nurse, what do we do with the collection tape when it's full? Oh, okay. Yeah, you were right. You put it in a biohazard bag and you put it in a biohazard bag. Okay. Some places, I think, have this um, powder that you can put on things that make it harden. I forget what it's called. Um, but you can put that down inside of there uh, just to see the risk of it spilling out as it's going out. It makes it, it's, it makes it gel. gel so what if the, this drainage system is full? It's a new drainage system. You don't pour it out. No, you don't pour it out. You get a new one. Okay. Yep. 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 Um, it's fluid collected in the oral space, but it happens usually over a long period of time. Um, it's not an acute hemothorax. This is some sort of fluid that is collected in the oral space because of a problem. You can have these local problems or systemic problems, and I'll, we'll talk about transudative, I guess we can say that now, transudative uh, pleural effusion. Realize that the reason that this type of pleural effusion is happening is because of a fluid shift into the pleural cavity, and it's because of increased capillary pressure or low plasma proteins. Right. So it means the blood is not, it's, it's hypoconcentrated, it's not hemoconcentrated, so it allows a leaking of fluid out into the pleural space. Or there's increased pressure in the capillary beds, and what happens, remember oncotic pressure, increased pressure in the vasculature, its way out into the nerve spaces. So here what's happening is it's increased out. So think about, you know, cirrhosis, heart failure, increased pressure, right? Um, hypoalbuminemia, that's decreased protein in the blood, so the blood is not concentrated like it should be, so it leaks out. 
never thought the fluid in Lake Flush would be so important, right? Yeah. So, okay. Exudative is where there is something wrong with the actual membrane of the capillary itself. So in transudative, it's not the capillary itself, it's, it's there's something wrong with the fluid or the pressure. But in exudative, there's something wrong with the permeability of the capillaries, and it's caused by these inflammatory disorders. You know how inflammation and things cause affect the vessels of change. And essentially, you will have the same symptoms as a hemopneumothorax over a period of time. Decreased <laughs> lung sounds over the affected area. You might have some chest pain and shortness of breath. But also realize that um, as a pleural effusion develops, sometimes the pain can resolve. Um, like if the patient has sarcoidosis, that involves lots of pain. But as a pleural effusion develops, it lubricates the pleural cavities better so it doesn't hurt the lungs as much. So sometimes you have pain, sometimes you have relief. Right. There's a nice little picture. All right. That's the pleural space. This is the lung, the alveoli. Right. And this just shows how the fluid is leaking into the pleural space because of this impaired um, wall. Very similar to that of a um, uh, hemopneumothorax in the nursing care. They uh, might get a chest tube, um, but remember that this person, the fluid developed over a long period of time. So they may not need a chest tube. They may just need a dorsentesis to get that fluid off, and then hopefully it doesn't recollect. But if it does recollect, it's not going to happen quickly. It'll happen over a period of time. Um, yeah, so the thoracentesis. So you've learned about a uh, amniocentesis, you've learned about a, a paracentesis, so thoracentesis. There's something pulling fluid off of something, right? Um, so, um, so this is the, the patient's position, so they should be sitting up. Um, and at this picture, is that a thorn? No, that's a, okay, because it looked kind of like a spinal yeah. tab, but it's this right here vacuum bottle collecting pleural fluid. So maybe they're just tapping. Um, right by the spot, not so good. Huh? But um, so this this patient, it's an invasive procedure, needs informed consent, all that stuff. It's done in the OR or at the bedside. Um, so just lidocaine is all that we need. But realize that when um, fluid is pulled off of the pleural space, um, there can be a large amount of fluid that's in there. And usually, they don't want to pull off more than about a liter and a half. So if that does happen, um, there can be a big shift inside of the chest cavity, and it can cause changes in preload and afterload. So therefore, the patient may have signs of increased cardiac output. Too much is taken off too fast. So if the patient ends up having, you know, two and a half liters in there, they're probably not going to pull all of it off at one time. They'll stop at about a liter and a half. Because we are putting a needle into the pleural space, we're at risk for what? Infection, of course, it's invasive, right? Um, let's see. The patient doesn't need to fast. This is important here um, because when the patient's the fluid is pulled off of the patient's pleural space, it may cause the patient to have a, a um, paroxysmal or cough. So they may cough as it's happening. We don't want that to happen because the patient moves, the lungs are moving, and there's a needle right there by your lung. So often the patient's using their cough suppressant before the procedure to help prevent. Saw the positioning that is required, um, and you're monitoring the patient continuously during this procedure. <clears throat> They're positioned on the unaffected side after the procedure. Why? So that affected lung can reinflate because air goes where it's up. So, so that it will uh, promote the, the reinflation of that lung that is affected if you put that lung up. We talked about sending blood gases to the lab and things like that. This is one thing that if we have to take a sample to the lab, maybe the, they want to see if there's any infection in it or, or whatever, what's in the fluid. Um, 
this is one of those things that we should physically walk to the lab because what because things get lost in two land. Um, and I don't know where things go when they say, oh, I sent that DMP an hour ago. We never received it. Somewhere. Um, or it's lost in two land. So we don't want this coral fluid to get lost in two land because why? It's very difficult to go get more. Yeah. So and somebody will be very upset with me. So um, make sure that this is taken directly to the lab. Some of you have seen bronchoscopy. This is another procedure. Uh, bronchoscopy, we just call it a bronch. Uh, so a bronch is, is where we put down into the patient's airway a, a tube that has the ability of a camera, a light, you can inject fluid through it, and you can suction through it. It allows us to visualize the airway. Okay? Because there might the patient may need a hygienic bronch where the patient has lots and lots of secretions. So we need to wash it out. Because the patient is intubated, they have infected or infected airway clearance, and then we need to clear this airway for them, but more than just fluid consumption. So we can go way down into the bronchioles with this. The patient may have a tumor, or they may need a biopsy, there may be a foreign body in the airway that needs to be removed. In your setting, probably unless you work in more of an outpatient area, uh, the patient will have an airway. Trailer or easy to while this is done. Does that person have one? He does not have one. That is, this patient is not intubated, so he's going straight into his nose, right? Which they can do. But it's not done in general anesthesia. Like this is dispensing. No, it's 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 bedside anesthesia that you will do, um, and um, so it's more um, conscious sedation. Yeah, the drawing. Which is a fine line between RN and CRN. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of lots of monitoring that goes on with that. See, I saw one on YouTube because I was trying to get those other things you put on in here. And they had him up at 30, semi college. He was sitting up. And he was away. Yeah. And they sedated him and then sprayed in his mouth. I think I've seen that video. But it does look like a healthy guy. Yeah. I would never want one. Yeah, I mean, just sitting out with like a big thing. I never want to be in there. Alright, so your nursing care surrounding a bronch, of course, is invasive, so the informed consent from someone should be um, obtained if it's the patient or the next of kin. Um, if we're going in without an airway, meticulous mouth care beforehand is a good idea because it puts a very dirty place. Yep. So, for next thing would be a good idea. Um, make sure that there's plenty of suction available in case we need to suction the patient's airway and the patient is at risk for uh, the need of resuscitation during this procedure. So, it's very, it comes with risk. It's not that minor. The patient um, will receive pain medication, sedation, and probably a paralytic. We already talked about all the three medications, like Versed, fentanyl, and maybe Um but also, but just continue to remember that if your patient is getting a paralytic, every muscle in the body is paralyzed except for the heart. So that means that they will improve. So do not give your patient a paralytic. Don't kill them. Alright? So uh, the patient who is having this procedure without an artificial airway would receive this pain medication and sedation. They would not receive a paralytic because you would kill them. Right? A paralytic should not be given if the patient does not have. The diaphragm is paralyzed. Yeah. The only muscle that is not paralyzed is the heart. Because if the heart is paralyzed, we'll just kill the patient. Right? So. <laughs> Alright. So the patient is at risk for laryngospasm, bronchospasm, so that increases the risk of the patient's airway clo airways closing off. Um, the, the, the airway can be perforated by this device. We can cause a lot of problems, infection. Cardiac distress, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, the respiratory therapist is going to work more closely with the physician during this procedure. Your responsibility is to do what, Tina? Assess the patient. Assess the patient. Yeah. Your patient got it wrong. Was it your patient? Mm -hmm. Oh, I should be in. I should be taking somebody else. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, so, um, so during the procedure, um, as a nurse, what did you do? You watched the patient, but you also watched for it. The bedside monitor, right? What were you assessing for? She's in shock. Yeah. <laughs> She was watching the vital signs, the heart rate, blood pressure, and the pulse ox to make sure the patient was tolerating the procedure. Yeah. The main thing that I want to watch is the pulse ox. Okay. Make sure that the patient is so oxygenating during this procedure. We'll put them on 100%, but still, they're not getting air. Well, it doesn't matter how much. GPA approach for all of that. Um, <laughs> so, um, and also, the, there can be a sample sent. For, during this procedure, and that should also be walked on foot because, well, it's very hard to get it. Right. The respiratory therapist will collect it and, and everything, but you'll, you'll be the one to take it down because they're getting all the equipment together and the cart and everything. Is that on ice or just regular bags? It should be on ice. If anything, one of the microbiology, um, you know, it doesn't have to be on ice. It would, it would go straight there. Okay. Um, so, what is the most common thing that you see in the so the thing that we should not be watching is what I'm going to show you, um, but it's just nice see. Because you can see the camera and you can see the, the inside of the patient's lungs, and it's really neat to see. Um, but remember, during this procedure, your main priority is to watch the patient and to make sure that the patient's tolerating this procedure. Because what's the physician watching? The screen. You see her doing this, and then the respiratory therapist is watching who? The physician, making sure that the physician doesn't need anything, suction, or fluid, or whatever. So you're the one. Not the machines. So let's watch it. One's, one's really long, so we're not going to watch all of it. I just want you to see part of it. Hopefully, it works. We perform a tour of the normal segmental anatomy of the bronchi by means of bronchoscopy on a healthy volunteer working with anesthesia. After passage through the nose, the pharynx, and the epiglottis, the glottis is reached. After inspection of the vocal cords and the carotenoids, the bronchoscope is advanced into the trachea. While staying in the of the the trachea is carefully inspected. <laughs> You see how right here, the uh, this part of the tra trachea um, is kind of <laughs> is kind of flat, and the uh, the top side is rounded. This is anterior, so that's their landmark. So if they're seeing this, they know that's the front of the patient. Eventually, we reach the main carina, where the left and right main bronchi originate. Can you say something? Okay, so the carina, right? So the carina is where, if that's irritated, what happens? Lots and lots of coughing, right? Um, so when you suction your patients when they're intubated, the tip of that tube is going right there. It's causing lots of irritation to the carina. So that's why they cough violently when you're suctioning them, when they're intubated. So we've, I and probably your clinical instructors have talked about when you suction, you go down until they cough, then you pull back a little bit and then begin suctioning so that the end of the catheter doesn't attach to the carina and damage it. But also, um, this is not the best visualization, but you know, when you talk about um, the um, when a patient aspirates or if they inhale a foreign body, which side of, the, of which lung is it most likely to go into? The right side. Do you see why now? Because it's more of a straight path. The left side kind of goes off to the side, but that's more of a straight path into the right main stem. We then rotate the bronchoscope 90 degrees clockwise and enter the right main bronchus. At the end of the right main bronchus, we recognize several important anatomical landmarks. 
We identify the orifice of the right upper lobe, the right carina one, the orifice of the middle lobe, and the orifice of the right lower lobe. We then enter the right upper lobe, which divides into the apical segmental bronchus, or RB1, the posterior segmental bronchus, or RB2, and the anterior segmental bronchus, or RB3. So that's getting more boring. We then the segmental bronchus, or and we start at the medial side of the lower lobe bronchus. But you see how far they can go down into the lungs. 90 degrees yeah, now, they're the now they're going to the left side. Bronchus, which is significantly longer than the right main bronchus. At the end of the left main bronchus, we can identify the... Why is the left bronchus longer than the right? It's got to get past the heart, yeah. right? Bronchus of the lingula. The left carina 2, which separates the upper and lower lobe, and the apical segment, or LB6, on the lower lobe. We advance into the lower lobe and first inspect the LB6 that immediately divides into three subsegmental branches LB6A, LB6B, and LB6C. <laughs> We retract from LB6 and continue further into the lower lobe. Here, we can identify the anterior basal or LB8, lateral basal or LB9, and posterior basal or LB10 segmental branches. A medial basal. Nah. <coughs> Let's see if I can find one. Mr. Um, Stasser, yes. it, is everybody in the yeah, everything. Does it does it all branch out the same for every person? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. There's going to be variations between uh, different people, different sizes of people, but in general, we're all about the same on the inside. But there is there are variations. Yeah, yeah. But I have heard before it's pretty chest that some people don't have like a, a right lower lobe, or you know, some people are just born you know with, 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 with mutations or whatever. But, um, let's see. <laughs> Maybe this will be good. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's what the mucus is. Oh, that one does. I could not find the mucus. Because probably you're going to see um, a, uh, a not a perfect bronchoscopy. You're going to see it's not going to look normal. Because all they would be. Do you see the difference in, in, in this these airways as opposed to the other ones? What's the difference here? It's red, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. This patient might be a smoker. Yeah. Oh, there's some secretions. They, and when they're doing it, they'll say, oh, we found some boogers. That's what they'll... What did they say? They found some boogers. The other airway... <laughs> this still isn't so bad. Usually they look even worse. Oh, wow. <laughs> they suction it out. They're not coughing because they probably got a paralytic. You know. So this would be, uh, this says the smoker's one. Let's see how red it is. That's the epiglottis, see it? And then below it's the vocal cords. Come on, go ahead. See how inflamed that is? See? Oh. But the other one that I had was foreign body. Um, and I, I tried to find the video, and I couldn't find one. 
and I couldn't get that one. Oh, that's cool. The whistle's making noise. Is it great? <laughs> what size is it going to be on? You see the heart moving? It's very close. All right. You can see it. Huh? They're going to go in with a little uh, claw. Uh, I'll talk about chest surgeries real quickly. There's not an extremely large amount of material that you need to know about chest surgeries. Uh, if you want to make any notes about chest surgeries, um, you'll know that after most of these uh, surgeries, the patient will come back with a chest tube. Um, so every patient post chest surgery is going to have a chest tube. So in all of these situations, lobectomy, you know that's the removal of a lobe of the lung, right? And know that the, the remaining tissue, lung tissue on that side, so maybe the right middle lobe was taken out, um, then the, the right lower and right upper will increase in size and fill that void when that lobe is taken out. A segmental resection um, is the removal of one or more segments of a, of a lobe. It's not as invasive, not as much as taken out, um, but again, that tissue will expand to fill that empty space. A pneumonectomy is obviously more invasive. It's an entire lung is taken out, probably. Um, and this person um, will have a chest tube post-op, but it will be clamped. This person's chest tube will be clamped for what reason? You might know. Since that empty cavity can fill up with fluid, right? And we want it to fill with fluid. We don't want it to be an open cavity in the air. So fluid will shift into that area. Fibrous tissues will form. Um, but we have a chest tube in case it overfills and a wedge resection is, an e is even less invasive than a segmental resection. Uh, maybe that's just a biopsy. But again, they will need a chest tube. Um, and decortication is not removal of any part of the lung, but it's the going into the chest cavity and usually scraping out infection. So this person may have had an empyema, which is an infection in the total space. Um, it's it's a, like an abscess in that area. It's just spread. Lots of infection in that space. And decortication, um, it's where they go in and remove this scar tissue and infection. Like a DNC. Kind of like a DNC for your lung. Yeah. <laughs> the patient um, may have an exploratory thoracotomy. Um, where they're simply going in and exploring and looking, maybe the patient's bleeding and they're trying to figure out where they're bleeding from. A lot of the patient, they have a thoracotomy and there's nothing wrong with their lungs, heart surgery, right? Esophageal surgery. So sometimes you have to go into the chest cavity and operate on something that's not for lungs. So that's a, some, something else that's being operated on. <clears throat> more and more, we're seeing this um, uh, uh, chest surgery is using scopes. So video assisted thoracic surgery, that's what the VATS procedure is. Uh, so if you hear VATS, that's what it is. Laparoscopic. 
You can even take out a whole lung this a whole lobe this way, but not a whole lung. The less invasive, the faster a patient recovers, right? So an ineffective breathing pattern, ineffective airway clearance would be priorities after this. Uh, have the patient turn, cough, deep breathe, lots of movement, make sure that they're filling that space and maximizing whatever they have left in regard to lung volume. Assessment of breath sounds, right? Not bowel sounds. Risk for infection, right? And this is related to your chest tube placement. So we talk a lot about chest tubes, but that increases your patient's risk for infection. Simply because the primary defense is impaired and there's a chest tube. All right, got through that. I think move to two so probably have a lot more to um, I think we just have the SARS. So you've probably heard about SARS, right? Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome is what that stands for. It's a severe form of viral pneumonia. So um, this, this disease began in Asia, and it was first identified in the early 2000s and has spread around the world. What do we call that word? Oh, pandemic. Pandemic, right? When the disease is spread around the world. So um, basically what is happening here is that you have a virus, and the type of virus is a coronavirus, and um, that virus causes lots of inflammation in the lungs, in the respiratory tract. And it's so severe that it can cause death of the, of the respiratory tissues, and the alveoli can just kind of slope away. What does sloping mean? It's just you know, it's close off. Whatever. Uh, so, therefore, because of all that inflammation and the inflammatory process, fibrous membranes can form. Um, and so, this can lead to ARDS, which we know is very, very bad, right? Very high mortality there. Still, I think, is an issue or has the potential to become a big issue. Initially, the signs of SARS are nonspecific. It's a virus, so you're going to have viral-like symptoms, right? Fever, achy, cough, maybe. Um, then, then you will have, as the disease progresses, more specific respiratory, severe respiratory symptoms that are going into this viral pneumonia and possibly ARDS. You probably wouldn't know this, but to diagnose a virus, it's usually just one. There's really no test you can do to diagnose most viruses. Uh, viruses are tricky. But we can do a few things to help us figure out if this is what it is. But um, what there is an ELISA test that we can do to try to uh, detect the coronavirus. Or we can do this fancy test here. But um, we're going to miss 66% of them. So why do it when we cost $1,000? So, um, you know, so you can follow the history. You know, maybe the patient traveled to, to Asia back and they've got the severe respiratory. So this should come into someone's mind if, if, if these symptoms come up. Probably don't need these expensive tests. Chest x-ray, CBC, and CBK, right? You know all about those labs. But also we want to make sure that it's not a bacterial type of pneumonia. So we could do this speed of culture and then if, it, if we detect a, a bacteria, what will we do? It's an antibiotics and hopefully fix it. But of course you know that the antibiotics don't fix viruses. You can, the patient could have the SARS uh, pneumonia, um, but, and then also when you have viruses, it can lead to bacterial infections. They're called super infections. So, it's fecal oral transmitted like sewage contamination if the chick's wearing the mask. No, it's respiratory. It's, it's inhaling. Right? Is it the outside the wrong thing? It's in the book. Okay. Is it awesome? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that the biggest risk is, is, is respiratory. It's a droplet. Droplet. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, she wouldn't be wearing a mask. She would be washing her hands. Right. Right. Because that's what confused me. I was like, well, you know, usually respiratory things. I'm thinking of droplet. Maybe, maybe if that fecal material aerosolizes. Oh. You know, and can, Anytime you smell, <laughs> you know, you the tongue's hard to contaminate. Uh, <laughs> 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 but that's not. Come on, Joe. 
<laughs> so I'm just trying to figure it out. So <laughs> air fluids can turn into gases, right? And becomes aerosolized. So, so it can be really damaged. Perhaps that's what you're saying. But, um, the, 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 the biggest risk is just respiratory uh, droplet, like you said. Um, but like I said, treat anything in super infections, bacterial infections, um, and viruses are very hard to treat. Um, most antivirals are crappy medications. It's like if you get the flu, I am not going to prescribe the camera flu. But this one, it doesn't work. Okay? Um, people think it works, so I think they feel better, you know. Uh, but I don't think it's super effective. Read the studies, it doesn't work. So most antivirals don't work. It is expensive. Um, sometimes my patients insist on it, and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to But um, $800, it might get better. Um, but, um, <laughs> but really, the only antivirals that work really well are those for HIV. Um, but these antivirals are not so good. Um, anyhow, so antibiotics, if it's bacterial, we can use hydrochlor we can use a steroid to simply decrease inflammation and hopefully de decrease that inflammatory response so that less mm -hmm. fibrous tissue is formed and scar tissue and all that stuff. Um, and of course, we want to treat fever. And you know how to do that. This patient, if you know, if they, if they end up in ARDS, which is possible, they would be on the ventilator. So all of your vent management, medication management surrounding that, and uh, this person will be on strict, strict, strict isolation, respiratory and right. Remember the difference between the respiratory and droplet perfunction. Just a plain mask for prophylaxis. If you spread out in public, that's just going to protect you against your droplet. But um, if they're on respiratory precautions, they need an N95 mask, right? It is a contagious, it's very contagious, so this person, we want to be at home if possible. Um, and tell them to, even though their fever has resolved, say your fever stopped on February the 1st, we don't want you to leave the house until February the 11th. And we would monitor their fever, or teach them to monitor their fever daily, strict hand hygiene. Um, so, So I think that this is a big nursing responsibility, mainly in the prevention of this. But what obstructive sleep apnea is, is uh, the, uh, the cessation of breathing during sleep. And it's, and it's intermittent. If you just didn't breathe all night, you just breathe. It, right? So it's intermittent access to airflow. And usually it's due because the, air, the, the airway, the upper airways close off for some reason with obstruction. Um, it's life-threatening because of the complications that it causes. So here are your uh, biggest risk factors. Being a large man, um, and if your neck size is greater than 17 inches, you need to lift weight. Um, so if your husband has a shirt that is about 17, 17 and a half, you need to be concerned about because he's at increased risk, greatly increased risk for stroke or sleep apnea. That's, that's the, the, the line. For women, it's 16 inches. So measure your neck. Because women don't buy things, I think, based on that size. Right. Right. Older men, and then anything that depresses the central nervous system is going to increase their risk of not breathing at night. So, so for some reason, uh, the, the muscle tone in the upper airways have been compromised, probably due to pressure because the patient is overweight. Um, 
and the pharynx actually collapses, so it prevents the flow of air, prevents what ventilation um, for a period of time. Um, gravity also plays a role, and the tone becomes increased, and you know the patient doesn't breathe for some reason. And that leads to what respiratory acidosis because you have a buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood because the patient is not breathing. Um, so when this happens, the patient will become um, a little acidotic and they will become hypoxemic. What happens? They wake up and they make this gasping sound and they're snoring, loud snoring. So um, that's what is happening. Um, and this can happen just a couple times during the night, but a person can do this a few hundred times a night. Not a very good situation. The biggest thing here are the complications from this. So what we're going to see mostly, the patient's going to tell us, I can never sleep good. I am always sleepy. I am always tired. So you should think, well, how do you sleep? Tell me about it. I wake up all night long. Okay. So and then they may they may say, well, I've been confused. My memory's not good. But also because of the ischemia or the hypoxia, it can lead to all of these things, right? Heart problems. So a big risk factor for hypertension and uh, heart failure is obstructive sleep apnea. Other things that we would see or that might report is they snore very loudly. They're always sleeping. They're always irritable. They're restless. And they don't have sleep. There's a box here that describes all the manifestations of this. So how do we treat or how do we diagnose this? Or we don't do it, but a polysomnographist will do it. They'll do the test. Um, they, it's a sleep study. Um, and they have the patient connected to lots of leads and wires. G is going, uh, cardiac monitoring, blood pressure, O2 steady, everything's going here. So um, we can monitor the patient's uh, sleep. So I talked about how being overweight is a big risk factor for this. So the patient should lose weight. Um, reduce or, then, or eliminate alcohol intake. Um, maybe they can help a little bit just simply by taking using some root glide strips. An improvement in this. Lay on the side, it's a good sleeping position. All right, so we treat it also with CPAP or BiPAP. Um, often the reason for non compliance with treatment of this is because the person just doesn't want to use this device. It's embarrassing, it's not portable, um, they just don't want to use it. You know, they don't, often they feel like they don't have a problem because um, they're sleeping. But CPAP, you know that that stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, um, and this is a, um, it's a machine that is connected to a hose and a mask, and it um, delivers cont a continuous pressure uh, against the airway to help prevent the airway from collapsing during the sleep. So it helps to keep the airway open. CPAP, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. But it's one pressure and it's continuous. BiPAP is very similar, um, but there's two pressures. BiPAP, right? Two. There's two pressures. There's a low pressure and a high pressure. So there's a higher pressure um, on inhalation, and there's a lower pressure on exhalation, so that there's not as much resistance to exhalation with BiPAP. BiPAP works a bit differently. It works more in synchrony with the patient. The BiPAP or CPAP machines, the mask can either be nose and mouth or just nose. Which one would you use the CPAP versus the BiPAP mask? It might be due to um, the, the severity. So they might need the, the, the CPAP if they're more severe. They need extra pressure than they use. But usually the BiPAP is, is just nasal. Sometimes it can be for the whole face. So, you know, it's just a prescriber's preference, patient's response. Insurance, but, but BiPAP works more in synchrony with the patient's body. <coughs> Things that often include the airway are the tonsils and the abdomens. I even have little kids in the clinic that the, the parents with this kid snores like a grown man every night. They start looking at throat and tonsils as big as my fist. Well, the ENT, and he's just, you know, he probably has sleep apnea. So um, it's, a big, it's a big deal. All right, so here's some nice pictures. 
So you might see why the patient may not want to wear this. <laughs> but this can literally save a person's life. Very simple. Um, when you use this machine, uh, the air must be humidified. It's not absolutely necessary, but it will dry out the signs of any frequent patient risk for noticeable discomfort. Um, but so it's best uh, for the patient to humidify. So this has to stay very clean. And the patient puts deionized sterile water. Or it doesn't have to be sterile, but it's just deionized water in this uh, heat, uh, chamber here, and it humidifies the air. All right. Lots of teaching that goes along with this prevention. Lose weight, quit drinking all the time, um, so this patient can get oxygen at night. Um, so if our body is hypoxic during the night, we're going to have lots of complications. What else? We talked about the properly fitting mask, medication, tell the patient you got to use it every night. Well, what about when I go visit my son in California? Take it with you, all right? They carry it on to the plane. Uh, they make them very portable. They're getting smaller and smaller. So they, um, they are portable. Complications, we just said one. Nosebleed, drying of the nasal mucosa, but also complication like the skin breakdown. So it's always was continuously assessed for that. And a lot of times our patients in the hospital will have these, so it's your responsibility to make sure that all of this is, is okay. Right. Sleep, feeling tired because they don't get oxygen, breathing is impaired, and gas exchange is impaired because you may not be ventilating. Right. So thanks. taking from this, the biggest thing is the complications of cardiac. So, hopefully, there's one person here from here being with your dad, um, who must sit in the chair because he's going so loud and doesn't really good. This yeah. Actually, my grandmother um, has sleep apnea probably for decades. In her position, you never can look at it. She always says, I'm tired. She has high blood pressure, heart failure. Oh, that's easy for a sleep study now that you're 70. Yeah, I was ready to say why did someone think of this before? And it's absolutely good support to the new practitioner. But, um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so that's the end of this. Um, I eat it early. I'm glad. So what questions do you have about respiratory? Respiratory is not as near, um, it's not as much volume as cardiac, uh, but it's still a lot of kind of complicated. Uh, yes? What are the medications involved in respiratory? We've talked about um, the kind of way went over this, but you might see them in the proton pump inhibitors, the uh, H2 antagonists, the bronchodilators, the inhaled anticholinergics. What else is there? Steroids. Steroids, oh, man, maybe. Yeah, we'll get really nice in the steroids in here when we talk about uh, 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 Methyl prednisolone? Yeah, that's a steroid. The alcohol. I talk about the alcohol. We'll talk about that with CFD. So, not, this, this team is not loaded with medications. Uh, do you remember that? <laughs> Do remember that oxygen is a medication. Um, so you people in well, everybody here is um, So in clinical, when your patient is on oxygen, that should be on the medication because it has complications and side effects, right? And indications and dosing and all that stuff. So call suppressants. Call just know what they do. Okay. We need to be expected. Responsible for the first seven pages of slides. Um, I'll probably. I'm sorry. Ventilator? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I won't ask a whole lot. You might see some more ventilator things on there, but you would see ventilator things on there because of EVGs. So I'll talk about how the tidal volume respiratory rate changes what? PCO2, right? And uh, PEEP and, and, and uh, FIO2 changes. 
So I was trying to say baritrauma earlier. Baritrauma, okay, that's complications of, of events of body. Well, like I, um, you should be able to identify the respiratory rates is, is high. And that said it would be out of the normal range. So if it's set at 20 out of 22, that's probably a high respiratory rate. So even if it's set on the high end of normal the event, you know it's a high setting. Because I said normally the event setting would be around 10 to 16 usually is a setting on the event. So if we've got a event setting of 24, you know that's a high rate setting. So maybe you think about ours, right? We still got to get the neuro first, right? Oh, that's hard to get. I can't remember. Does anybody have? Um, so I'm just trying to think of what we probably will get through. Let's let's get some a couple minutes. I want you, so you can prepare for um, Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, I'll, I've got it. Okay, so when you pull up your respiratory slides, the first, or excuse me, neuro slides, the first thing that you're going to see um, are your definitions, but then we'll go back over a really good uh, neuro assessment, which is important, the Glasgow Coma Scale, um, and all these things that you probably know. Look over posturing and uh, 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 the neurological assessment. One thing that is going to be a, a big challenge for you is, is, is learning the cranial nerves. Um, so we we'll probably begin that over the weekend, um, and we'll talk about all this. But the, 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 by far the, the biggest chunk of what we will talk about on Tuesday is, in, is intracranial pressure, uh, specifically increased intracranial pressure. So uh, you need to review that in depth uh, and make sure that you have at least an understanding of what is going on when the patient has the problem of increased intracranial pressure. And we will stop at the end of that, and we will begin with traumatic brain injuries a week from today. All right. So over the weekend, what you need to be learning is uh, increased intracranial pressure, specifically the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis, um, the theory of you know, what's in the head. Um, so. Do we get all the way through neuro for this test? Yes. Yes. Yeah.